This UCSD TV program is a presentation of University of California Television for educational and non commercial use only. Today what I'm going to do is take you through a lot of our work on trying to understand how coral reefs are declining and what the microbes have to do with it. And what I'll argue is we're really trying to understand and predict how ecosystems work and see how they decline over time and really understand can we go backwards in time. Up to this point we actually haven't been able to do this. And the main reason is, is we actually haven't known about most of the organisms that are in any particular environment, and that's because most of the organisms are actually the microbes and the viruses. There's about a million bacteria uh, per mill in the world's oceans, and about 10 million viruses. Those are the bacteria, and then all the little things are the viruses. For the most part, the viruses are actually, um, they are viruses called phage that infect the bacteria. And they're one of the main controls on the types and number of bacteria that we have. Now, I hate to do this to you, but I'll just start with this. This is the, the really horrible thing. So you have to memorize all this. Okay? <laughs> so the, the general rule of how the world works is that you have a primary production, right? So these are your plants and your um, uh, trees on land, grasses and of course algae out in the ocean. And what it does is it fixes carbon, and the carbon gets mostly shunted as sugar into this dissolved organic matter pool. To give you a feel, about half of the primary production that's done every day ends up either in the soil or in the water. Okay? And that dissolved organic matter feeds heterotrophic bacteria. And the heterotrophic bacteria are actually controlled, the number of them, the total numbers that you have are usually controlled by two predator guilds, these viral phage predators and these uh, nanoflagellate protists. The way everything is working out there is that, for the most part, the faster this part of the system goes, the happier the microbes are. Now, coral reefs, of course, exist in, the, in seas, uh, and what they've got is they've got rushing over them, this million uh, bacteria per mill running onto the reef, and they have to deal with all these microbes. Corals, of course, are really interesting. They are, for uh, all intents and purposes, they're hunters, so they're cnidarians, so they have these uh, nematocysts, so they reach out and eat zooplankton and stuff by killing them. They're gatherers because they build the reefs, right? So the reefs actually cause upwelling in different parts of the ocean, and that brings up the, the nutrient-rich water from the bottom. Okay. They're farmers because they have these zooxanthellae, which are these uh, uh, dinoflagellates that live inside um, their tissue, and it allows them to uh, harvest energy via photosynthesis directly. And then finally, of course, they, they're the builders of the reefs, and they build these structures, which are the biggest things actually that ever built on the Earth by a fair amount. And one of the main questions that I started with was just what's the interactions between corals and this microbial part of the world? This is what an electron micrograph would look like over the top of a, a coral. This is also basically how the, your lung would look, just so you know. So what you have is the tissue here, and then you'll have, these are the cilia, okay? and then this is a mucus bubble. And what's happened is that the mucus bubble comes up like this, and then it's actually collapsed because of the way we've treated the sample. So normally that would pop up, and then the cilia would knock it off. That's how you clear your lungs. It's how a coral surface clears its, um, itself of bacteria. The bacteria look like they actually live as little uh, tufts or little microcolonies on the surface, but they're actually never touching the coral. So you can see here, there's always a protective uh, mucus layer between them and the bacteria on top. Coral um, microbial interactions, or specifically the coral bacteria interactions, are um, specific. It's the same with people. So you guys have specific microbes that are different from, uh, uh, from apes, for example. Okay. 
Corals are the same way. So even though they're sitting in this uh, in water where you think, oh, they can just, a microbe can move from one to the other, it's actually not true. So this coral right here will have completely different microbes than this one right here. Okay? And it doesn't matter, even when they're touching each other, they'll have totally different microbes. Each coral will have hundreds of unique bacterial species on it. Right? So most of the diversity on the reef is actually the uh, micro microbes living on these different surfaces. Okay. Now, if you look at this coral a thousand kilometers away, what you're going to find is that it has the same bacteria. As so you can look all over the world and you can find that uh, one coral species will have a hundred different types of unique bacteria, and they're only specific to those corals. If you take all this together, you build something that we call the coral holobiont. And what that is, is it's the, it's the coral animal with the zooxanthellae, the algae that live in it. Okay? And these can change depending on the same coral can have different types of these. The bacteria and the viruses, most of the diversity is going to be here, as well as the protists that live on top of them. And in this coral skeleton, you'll actually have uh, this endolithic algae and endolithic fungi that lives in them. And these guys exchange um, uh, nutrients. They explain, exchange genetic information. There's a whole bunch of stuff going on in there. Now, the question becomes, how do you actually study the microbes and the viruses on corals? And why that's always been difficult is because, for the most part, you can't culture most of the microbes out there. Okay? And that's about 98, 99% of them. And it's even harder to study the viruses because to study a virus, you have to culture the thing that the virus is going to eat. So you can imagine most of the viruses we've never studied. And the way we actually do that is we just go out to a system and this was invented at Scripps um, for the most part. And what we'll do is we'll isolate uh, uh, microbial and viral DNA, take the DNA, and we're just going to sequence it. So we're just going to get the code for all the different uh, pieces of DNA there. And then from that, we can predict the types of microbes that you have and what sort of genes they're encoding. Right? Does that make sense? Okay. And this is what we call metagenomics. And you may hear me say, Viriomes or microbiomes, just so you know. Sometimes I fall into the jargon. That just means the viruses or the microbes. And this is how you do it with a coral. You take the coral, you blend it up, and then you take the, the slurry and you fractionate it. And what you get is the microbes on, on the top, and then the zooxanthellae in the coral tissue is actually at the bottom. If we take this, then we're, we'll go and sequence it, and we're going to ask what types of microbes do we have there. And from this, you can actually figure out what are they doing? How do they interact with each other? And what is important um, in this, this figure right here is that most of the microbes that we find on coral are actually just eating the mucus that's associated with the coral. That's what their, their main job is. So what is going on on the coral and what you learn accidentally with some of these approaches is that the coral and the microbes living on them actually form this really amazing system where they can uh, manipulate the nutrients that are coming in. So most coral reefs occur in, uh, in nutrient-limited environments. Okay. And so what they're, uh, one of the main nutrients that they're missing is nitrogen. And you don't have to remember all this, but I just want you to follow this a little bit. So if you take gaseous nitrogen from the atmosphere, there are living on corals cyanobacteria, which can fix the nitrogen. They can make ammonia which then can be denitrified by a whole different group of microbes called archaea. Okay. And then, instead of losing the nitrate and nitrite, okay, which would normally be put off as gas, they actually, there is fungi that change that back to ammonia. So they recycle the thing. So this is all three domains of life actually working together to recycle nutrients within the coral holobiont. That's the good stuff. Now I'm going to get into the depressing part of it. Okay. So here is our hypothesis. Remember, we've shown basically corals and microbes form these specific associations. And one of the predictions is that these things can fall apart when you stress the system. Of course, you know that coral reefs have this uh, global decline. And I'm just going to show you what that looks like. All right, so this is a coral reef. This is actually in the Indo-Pacific. And what I really want you to notice here is that you have a whole bunch of different coral types. They form these massive three-dimensional structures. So you can see they're basically competing for space with each other. There's a lot of different fish and a lot of different types of fish. 
there will actually be a lot of big fish eating all the small fish, which we'll come back to in a little bit. Okay? So this is the site, and, this, uh, and then we went back to it five years later. Okay? And this is what's happened to it. Okay? And you can see you lose all the structure, so all the coral has died by now. Okay? And this is all covered with a type of algae that we call a turf algae. So this is just a microscopic algae for the most part. You've lost most of the fish, especially the big ones. Right there, that's just a microbial mat to let you know. And that's what's going on essentially all over the planet. And we think, of course, that it has something to do with people. And the main uh, considerations have been the changes in uh, CO2 in, on the environment. So the idea being that maybe we're changing the temperature and the, the way the temperature is distributed across the planet. And that leads to probably the most famous, which is uh, if you increase the temperature of a coral, it causes coral bleaching when it loses its ozone belly. Okay? The other one that we're getting, uh, that people are concerned about, of course, is acidification, because as you add CO2, you actually change the pH of the, the oceans. And then finally, there's this, this thing, which is what I'm mostly interested in, is there's something about local. So if you put people on coral reefs, they start dying. Putting, there's something about people that kill coral. And we think it has things to do with overfishing and nutrient additions. And this is the one I'm mostly going to talk to you about today. This is an experiment that I ran when I was at Scripps uh, with Nancy Knowlton. And we built this, uh, this system down, Davy Klein and I built the system down in Panama. And what we did is we put little, each one of these cups has a, a little coral nubbin in it. And then we take water right off the reef, and just as it's running into the, uh, into the coral, uh, where the coral is, we'd add some treatment of some sort. Okay, so we're going to test all these potential things that might be killing corals. And the surprise was the only thing that actually killed corals directly in this experiment were additional carbon sources. Okay? So nutrients didn't do it, uh, pH didn't do it, a whole bunch of other things that we thought. So these are these different carbon sources. And it really doesn't matter what carbon source you use. You could use uh, naturally occurring carbon sources, things you buy from a chemical company, et cetera. And all of them would actually kill the corals. The other thing that happened is that when we did the, uh, this is the carbon source treatment here. When we did this, the, this is the growth rate of the microbes associated with the corals. We saw this change in the amount of coral, the rate at which the corals were growing. Okay? So all this suggests that what we're doing is we're actually changing that relationship between the coral and the microbes that live on them. So the, if you take some of the specific bacteria that live on a coral, and we, there's just a way of culturing them up on LB or on TCBS, you come up with these two different bacterial groups. And if you add them back at a higher concentration than they're normally on the coral, they kill the corals. Okay? So the bacteria that live on the corals are actually able to kill them. That's true of you. You're probably, about a third of you are carrying a microbe that will kill you and in the end. That's what's going on here. Okay. It's good to know. At least you've been carrying them, feeding them, and now they'll get you like children. So what that means is that you've got the, on, normally on a coral surface, you've got um, these microbes that are living there. They can potentially come back and get you, but for the most part, you're controlling them, and we think you're controlling them by the mucus that you're feeding them. Okay. Now, if we go onto a reef, how does this all go together, and how do we understand how microbes might be uh, influencing reef dynamics? Okay. On this healthy reef, most of the algae, you couldn't actually see it, right? So if you go to a healthy reef, all you essentially see are coral and surfaces where the fish have been grazing. That's because the algae is grazed extremely fast by the fish, okay? And so you're always moving uh, the sugars from the algae up into the fish. And the first thing that we do as we come along and we eat the fish. Okay? And what that does is that allows the sugars from the algae to add to the dissolved organic carbon, which can either feed the microbes that are already living on the corals, the ones that we've seen can kill them, or they're actually feeding the ones in the, uh, the water column, which could potentially come back and feed the, uh, attack the corals also. So does that happen? I'm going to show you a couple experiments where we actually looked at right where algae is growing next to coral. So what we're going to be interested in is this zone right here. So this is an algae that has not been grazed down, so it's growing up to be bigger, and it's starting to kill the coral. 
And if you look right at that interface, what you'll see is that the coral surface right here okay, is still basically microbial free like we saw before. Okay? But right up against where the algae is, you can see these massive microbial mats. Right? So all the microbes are right up against the coral. And if you just stimulate that in the environment, so now imagine we're, what we're going to do is we're going to put coral next to algae in these little things here. And we're just going to watch what happens to the coral when it's across from the algae. And between them, we're going to put a filter. And the filter blocks viruses or bacteria from moving between them. So the only thing that can move are, are things that are dissolved in the water, like sugar or something of that nature. Okay. When we do this, coral across from algae, all of the corals die. Okay. Coral by itself, it's fine. If you do the same experiment and you put coral across from algae, but now you add an ampicillin, which is an antibiotic, all of the corals live. Right? So what that tells you is that there's something coming from the algae that's associated with microbial activity that can kill corals directly. The way we think it's working after lots and lots of uh, uh, different false starts is basically they're just suffocating the, the, the coral, it looks like. So what's going on here is that this is a microprobe. And you can go in and you can actually look at algae, um, at, sorry, oxygen gradients at about a millimeter to a micron scale. And so we're going to go in and we're going to look at where the coral's dying, and we're going to measure the amount of oxygen there. If you do that, if you go back to that experiment where the coral was dying here across from the algae, what you can see in seawater, that's our 100% dissolved organic, uh, dissolved oxygen. Where you go to the coral across from the algae, it goes totally hypoxic, so there's no oxygen there. And then when you get back to seawater, it's 100%. And then when you get across from the algae, it goes higher. And that's because the algae is actually doing photosynthesis, so it's producing oxygen. The same is true of coral by itself. It produces oxygen when there's nothing across from it. Okay? If we add antibiotics to this system, we actually prevent this hypoxic zone. And we can find this happening on a coral reef. So this, is, uh, this just shows you what happens if we go out and we're going to grab coral algal interfaces. So here's an algae. Here's a coral. Okay? And if you look where the coral and the algae are next to each other, you actually find this, these hypoxic zones. So this is where uh, we don't have enough oxygen for the coral. And this is how evil the algae is. So here's the algae right here. This is a different pigment. Can you see it's coming in underneath the coral right here? Okay. And it's forming that little white spot on the coral. So it's coming in from underneath, and it's causing the hypoxic zone. The only time that that happens is when you let the algae grow up so it has more energy to put into those sorts of things. And this is the model. So we call this the dam model. And the idea is, is that Basically, it's coral diseases that are killing the coral. Okay? And what they're doing is they're creating more space for algae. Okay? And then the algae is producing more of the dissolved organic carbon, which is then feeding the microbes and causing more disease. Okay? This ends up causing a positive feedback system. Okay? And positive feedbacks are bad because once you get going down them, you can com completely convert a, one system to another. And what we're doing, of course, is normally we'd have the grazers keeping the, the algae down. And by fishing, we're removing the grazers. The other thing that we can do, which I'll show you in a second, is indirectly we can feed the algae by adding nutrients to the water. Does this actually happen in, in big systems, like if we go out and just look in the environment? And what we're going to do here is look at the water column microbes. And in particular, we're going to go to the northern line islands. And the, Four that I'm going to talk about are Kingman, Palmyra, Fanning, and Christmas. And they have different concentrations of people on them, or different numbers of people on them. And this is basically what happens. So here, you have no people. You have lots of sharks. You have lots of coral on the bottom. You have a lot of coral and algae. That's the pink stuff. And corals like coral and algae. You have Palmyra, where, which is a refuge now, but it was fished at, uh, previously. And you're starting to get a little bit more algae in this system. If you go to fanning or tabarane, it's also called, you can see you've lost all the big animals, right? And all you have are the little fish. And your bottom is starting to shift to away from coral to algae. 
And then you take some place like Christmas, and what's happened is you've gotten rid of essentially all the fish. You just have very small ones. You can see dead corals still standing, so we know this happened relatively recently. We also know that from other stuff. And the bottom has become essentially all algae. This is what happens with the microbes. So the microbes going across, so the kingman, no people, Christmas with the most people. What you see is the number of microbes here go up by about an order of magnitude, as do the viruses. And most of those viruses are actually the ones that are killing, uh, are eating the, the bacteria. So we see a massive increase in the number of uh, microbes. The other thing, though, that we can do, is, of course, is to figure out what types of microbes they are using those methods I showed you before. So we're going to go in, collect a whole bunch of water, bring it up, and then sequence the DNA that's associated with them and ask what sorts of microbes we have there. Same thing, here are the, the four islands, people, no people. You see this increasing in the number. But what I really want you to notice is this, this box, these boxes right here. So if you ask, what types of microbes do I have, they've actually switched from, this is, a, this is what an open ocean community would normally look like, where you have some heterotrophic bacteria, so these are the ones eating the fixed carbon, as well as ones that fix carbon, so these are the, the cyanobacteria, to essentially all heterotrophic bacteria here. This is another way of looking at it. If you culture the, remember I showed you those microbes that could come back and kill the corals? Okay? This is a specific group of those microbes. And if you look on the coral surfaces, you can see without people, we essentially cannot detect any of them. And then when we get to where we've got the people, you see this increase in the number of them. And then this is probably the, uh, the final thing that really pulls it all together. What we're looking at here is the amount of coral that we've got on the bottom, and then this is the disease prevalence going along on this axis. And what I want you to notice is that where we've got more coral, we actually have less disease. Okay? And this looks exactly like what you expect. Any big population of animals should have a disease incidence of about 5%, which is exactly what we find on Kingman. However, where we, on Christmas, where we have almost no coral left, all of them are sick. That means that you've got something like an opportunistic infection going on. So there's something about that system that's bad for them. And it's the water quality, effectively, because of all that extra algae. Taking it all together, what you can say is someplace like Kingman, most of the primary production, the algae and stuff, are feeding the fish. And that's why the corals are doing well, because they're, not, uh, they're able to control the microbes. Some place like Christmas, most of the primary production is actually sponsoring, uh, supporting microbes, and that's where, what you're seeing there. And what we found now is that if you look across the whole Pacific Basin, this is happening, it's almost a perfect correlation between people and the number of microbes that we're finding in the water. All right, now let's step back and let's start thinking about the other parts of the holobiont. In this experiment, what we've got is corals in aquarium, and we're going to we're going to look at the influences, direct influences of nutrients, temperature, and pH on the microbi microbes associated with the coral. Remember when we did the culturing before, we didn't actually see that these, these killed them. Okay? But that doesn't mean that they, they can't be causing problems. We're going to isolate the microbial communities and then ask what microbes are there. The take home from this is all of the stressors, so anything that we do to a coral, in an aquarium like this, so we're going to do, it doesn't matter whether it's temperature, organic carbon, pH, or nutrients, all of them increase the number of pathogens associated with the coral. So even though it's sublethal, we're seeing a change in the, the associations. And you can imagine that over time, that actually will lead to coral decline. The more important thing I think is right here, all of these things actually led to more virulence factors. Finally, this stuff actually leads to um, predictive models of what's happening because you can go in and you can ask, of those virulence factors, were they the same across all of the corals and the different stressors, or were they, the, uh, or were they different by stressor? And you can see that temperature has a different pattern than DOC, than pH, than nutrient. So this gives you the ability to go into the system and actually ask, What's happening? What, what stressors are the uh, corals uh, seeing? And 
taking all of that together, this is just this big model, which is horrible to do to anybody. Um, but this is this idea that any stressor that we add to the coral actually increases more pathogens, and it does it in specific ways that we can uh, predict what's going on. What about the viruses? We're going to do the same experiment, but in this case, we're going to isolate the viruses and ask which ones are there. And the uh, take home message for this is that three of the stressors, temperature, pH, and nutrients, actually induce or cause, us, uh, uh, cause more herpes viruses to be uh, associated with the coral. And what's going on here are these are actually herpes viruses that already are living in the coral. So just like you, where you have the um, herpes viruses that pop out when you're stressed, that's what's going on here. And we can actually show that. Um, so if you take the corals and you stress them out with, different, with the different stressors, they actually, we see more herpes viruses in a matter of hours. So that doesn't mean reinfection. It just means that the ones that are there are already coming out. Again, this is one of these other stressors on the system right here. So I didn't want to leave it just totally gloomy. So they get to fight back. <laughs> and this is one of my favorite places that we go to. It's called Millennium Lagoon. And Millennium uh, is really one of the most pristine systems left um, on the planet. And what happens in this system is that water gets pushed into the lagoon when the tide is high. Okay? And then it rushes out this direction when the tide goes out. And it goes out right here. So the water's moving all the way down this way. And you can see that the coral has built these little ribbon reefs across. And it's using those ribbon reefs to suck out things that are coming down through the water. And it's, these are the ones that are doing it. It's just absolutely beautiful. Um, these are a type of coral. These are the big, the, the semi-big clams. Uh, these are giant scallops. And then these are ascidians, which um, are a hemichordate. And they're actually sucking all the bacteria out. And this just shows you what happens with giant clams. So if you take a giant clam and you throw it in, in an aquarium, it eats all the bacteria and actually all the viruses. And if you just put the shells in there, um, then of course all the bacteria and uh, viruses are quite happy. And if you take this and you just move those clams into the place where the shells were, they'll clean up all the bacteria. And the thing that they do, remember these are these, uh, the, these are actually those pathogens I was telling you about, the vibrios, the ones that can actually kill the coral. And what they'll do is they'll remove them very quickly. So they kill most of the pathogens. They remove them out of the water. Hopefully, <laughs> I've kind of convinced you that this is where we, we think we have a good handle on how we're going from this system, from the coral reef system, to this algal-dominated system mostly by this combination of, the, of uh, humans and overfishing with the, the microbes, the secondary effects of the microbes. And what we're trying to do now is actually go back the other way, uh, working with one of our collaborators at Scripps, uh, Stuart Sandin. And the idea is, is if we add back razors and filter feeders, can we actually drive the microbes down and get rid of enough algae to get the corals to come back in the system? <laughs>